Hey there guys, The Network Bear here. Hope you've been doing well. So let's get into 2024 covering one of the greatest and also simplest protocols on any device almost, namely LACP. I love LACP because it is an open standard. It means that you can configure this between different vendors and it should in essence work exactly the same. Now, a lot of people tend to make videos on LACP highlighting one of its core strengths, namely the additional capacity that you might introduce inside of your network. But that's not the only thing that makes LACP such a great protocol and why you should consider using it. So hopefully this video will show you the strengths of LACP, what it is, what it does, and how to just quickly configure this on a Microtik device. And again, you could take this to another vendor's equipment, configure LACP, and the devices will be able to communicate and also just give you more bang for your buck. So let's get into the video. So let's just briefly go into the why of LACP. Why would you maybe want to consider using it? And I think again, top reason that most people will cite is because you are able to increase your capacity across the network. Now that is great for various reasons because you could in essence take two or more physical interfaces, bundle them together between two devices, maybe a router and a switch, or maybe even something like a switch and a server which has multiple NICs. You can bundle these interfaces together in order to increase available capacity because maybe you've got two one gig interfaces or two 10 gig interfaces and you can bundle them together for a mega two gig or 20 gig trunk and that is quite quite useful because now you've got that additional throughput that you can potentially push across the network it is worth noting that each interface still is capped to its actual capacity but using some smart hashing algorithms is able to try and effectively distribute traffic across all multiple or all available interfaces. Now, there's another big reason why you might want to use LACP. And this is a reason I don't typically see people talk about a lot. And it's really, really, really important. You are also adding a layer of redundancy or resiliency into the network. How? Well, you've got these multiple interfaces and with LACP, even if one of these interfaces fails, let's say some physical issue occurs, maybe some mice or rats chew through a cable or some handyman accidentally breaks the cable because they were working too hard with a saw or something, the LACP trunk will still stay up as long as any of the available members are still available. It will still be able to forward traffic, receive traffic, and life just goes on. So it gives you that actual redundancy, which is really, really useful for many networks besides just having, you know, these failover protocols and OSPF to figure out different paths and stuff. Now you can have this logical interface that even if one of the members go down, everything still keeps working. And that is really, really useful. And I think that's not talked about enough. Now we are going to, in essence, be configuring LACP between a Microtik HAP AX3 as well as a CSR326. Why? Because that's what I have in front of me and I've also factory defaulted both of the pieces of equipment so this can be more in line with what somebody might see if they are using Microtik equipment out of the box. So let's actually log on to our Microtik devices and configure LACP so that we can have this additional capacity as well as redundancy. Now all that I'm going to do is log on to my CSR326. My actual computer is currently connected onto the CSR on Ether1. It is using default configuration. And I will see that Ether23 is currently also connecting, and that's actually an uplink to my HAP AX3. Now I will connect an additional cable onto Ether24 so that we can actually use the bonding properly. But let's just start with a single interface so we can get the bonding going. Now, how do we configure bonding? Well, we can go to the bonding tab or just click on the plus from interface and click on bonding. I will head into bonding and click on the plus. And from here, it gives you this nice pop-up. You can give it a name. You might want to make it descriptive if you're going to use multiple bonds so that you know what it is actually doing. So maybe this is going to a server or it's going to the router. So I might make this something like bonding one dash uplink dash hap ax3. And if we go into the bonding tab, this is actually where all of the magic happens. Now the slaves, you must think of the interfaces that you actually want to bundle into this logical interface. Now, Ether1, obviously, I'm not going to use this. This is going to be our uplink ports. 
Now this is going to be Ether 23 and Ether 24. Now it's worth noting if I try and add this with the default configuration, it is going to fail because you're not allowed to add slave interfaces as slaves in a bonded interface. What does that mean? Well, if we look at our bridge with the default configuration, there is a single bridge and all of the ports are bridged into this bridge interface, which in essence creates them as slave interfaces. To fix that, all that we need to do is remove the ports that we want to participate in the bond out of the bridge. So this is going to be Ether 23 and Ether 24. So I will just remove them from the bridge. And once they are removed, I can head back into the bonding interface and continue with the setup. My mode is going to be 802.3 AD. What is that? That is the nice and fancy name that is defined as the standard for LACP. This is going to be what you want to use with any other device or vendors or even between other microtics in my opinion. There are these other things, balance, RR and whatnot, and you can look on the microtech documentation what they do. But 802.3 AD is going to be your best bet. We can also set stuff like link monitoring. This is just to make sure if the link's up or down. I will leave this on MII because this is between microtics. And here is a very important one, the transmit hash policy. Now, some people tend to just leave this as layer two. They configure the bond, then they start testing it and they see, hey, only a single interface is actually doing the traffic. What's going on? Now, you need to understand this transmit hash policy is kind of telling you what it's going to be actually, let's say, forwarding or receiving stuff on. Now, layer two obviously means MAC addresses. Layer two and three is going to be MAC addresses and IP, and layer three is going to be IP and ports. Now this is kind of where you're deciding how you want to load balance things. Now, since my network is going to be in involving a lot of connectivity out to the internet and a lot of things that I want to do uh, on a port level as well, I will typically use something like layer three and four as my transmit hash policy. You might just have to tweak that around to see what works best for your network, but this is what I find works the best for me. It load balances the best whenever I'm using the links and testing. The rest of these settings, they just involve a few minor tweaks that you can do with LACP. Again, you can read the documentation. The default I find works best, so I'm not going to tweak anything here. So I will just apply this. Once this is applied, we can see it's created a new bond interface named bonding1-uplink-hapax3. Awesome. Now that is the bonding done on the one side. Let's quickly do the bonding on the other side as well. Now for this, I might just move the cable from my CSR into the HAP AX3 directly so that I don't lose connectivity um, while trying to do the configuration. So I'm just connecting onto the HAP AX3. All right, so let's connect onto the HAP AX3. I did actually do a factory reset without a default configuration, so I just reset it again. So let's get back onto here. There we can see the default config. And same thing, if I navigate to the interfaces, we can see the current interfaces. Ether1 is actually going onto my ISP's equipment via DHCP and just giving us internet access out. Ether3 is currently connected to my machine, my computer. And then Ether5 is going down to the switch. So let's do the same process, head into the bridge, identify which ports we need to remove for the bond interface or the LACP trunk. So I know this is going to be Ether5 and 4. I'm just going to remove them out of the bridge. Once they've been removed from the bridge, I can get back into the bonding tab for the interfaces, click on the plus, and then I can give it a name again, bonding one down uplink dash switch one or something. We can set, or we can go onto our bonding interfaces. And then our slaves I know will be ether four and ether five. Again, important, make sure that you use the 802.3 AD mode. If you don't, you're gonna have a bad time. And I'm also just going to move the transmit hash policy to layer three and four. I will apply the configuration. And now we should have an uplink down to our switch. Now this is typically where a lot of people might stop the configuration, but it's worth noting you can treat this bonded interface, this logical interface, just as you would any other interface as well. And you can add this interface back into the bridge so that it can actually you, be a part of the same broadcast domains or if you're working with VLANs and stuff, then that is why you'd like to maybe just add that back into the bridge itself. So in the ports, I will just add this interface, the bonding interface to the bridge and apply that. And I might do the same on the switch as well. Let me quickly see if I can access the switch at the same time. So I can get to the switch as well. So let's connect. 
And I just want to do the same thing very quickly, although this might disconnect me when I move that port back in. So from our ports, click on the plus, and I'll say the bonding interface, I'm moving into the bridge, and I will apply that. So once that's been applied, we've technically got the same default configuration again, we just have a bonded interface or an LACP trunk configured. Awesome. And I see I didn't even drop there, so that is quite nice. Now what I'm going to do is just quickly go back into the router. So from the router, there's a few things that I want to check out. Maybe I want to see if it is actually working. And since I don't have the second cable connected yet, this is actually not doing much. But that's kind of the cool point is, again, this is running on a single interface. So even if the other interface failed, it could keep working. So I'm just going to connect another interface quickly. So I'm going to connect Ether 4 on this HAP AX3 into Ether 24 of the CSR 326. So this is actually the cool bit. Just quickly connecting the cables. And now that the cables have been connected, if I look at the interfaces, we should see that the other interface comes up and the bond is actually going to be working now. So let's just close all the windows again. <laughs> the disconnects, don't worry too much about them, it happens. Uh, let me just quickly jump back onto Winbox. This is kind of why people also suggest using a separate management interface if you are doing these type of configurations. And I highly recommend doing that as well. I might just make a separate video just kind of more explaining the uses of using a dedicated management interface. All right, cool. So now that we have this configured and we see our interfaces is up and running, how do we actually test this? So what I might do, and I'm going to disconnect again, is I'm going to move this cable back from the HAP AX3 down to the switch so that frames and packets are being forwarded from the switch up to the router and then the router can do what it needs to do. But I want to have a very, very big look or I want to have a consistent look at what the interfaces are actually doing. And I can do this from the switch as well. If we look at our interfaces um, and we just zoom in again. So let's zoom in again. And then from the interfaces, we know Ether 23 and 24 is respectively going to be busy with a few things. And I know that I am using that hash transmit policy layer three and four. So how can I test this? Well, maybe I can just quickly open up a browser window. And then from the browser, we can go to something like fast.com. And we are having issues connecting to the internet. Uh, let's just see what's happening. I might just quickly do an IP config renew and release. IP config forward slash release. IP config forward slash renew. One thing that is also going to be quite relevant with this configuration, since I'm using the default config, and technically both MicroTix have the dot one IP address assigned to it at the moment, because if you're not aware, MicroTix by default tend to have this 192.168.88.1 IP address assigned. So since this is on this bridge, technically that's also on the IP address of the HAP AX3, and that might cause some conflicting IP addresses. So I'm just going to turn this off on the switch since I'm not using this on the switch actually. And now that I've done that, <laughs> we can see my default gateway was 88.1, so that would have caused some issues. Let's quickly see if I can ping out to Google now. And this is why I love making videos like this because you will also potentially run into the same type of issues. And awesome, I can see I do actually have internet out. So let's go back into our window and let's go to fast.com. And I do technically have a gigabit connection, but I tend to just get around 900 megabits, but that, that's, that's fine. It doesn't really bother me too much. Let's just go into the show more information. And then I want to change a few settings here so that we can push a little bit more bandwidth. Although I've only got a one gig connection from my computer. What I'd like to actually show you is how traffic is being load balanced across the interfaces. So let's maybe make the min connections 8, 20, and let's test maybe for 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Let's give this a go and see what happens. So we can see we are pushing some traffic. And if I head back into Winbox, what's nice is if we look at these interfaces, we can actually see that traffic is currently being load balanced. Now, don't be too weird out if you see this one interface does a gig and the other interface does like 500 megabits, even though I've only got a gigabit connection from my computer. It's just that Winbox has seen so much traffic that it, it kind of thinks for a millisecond that there's a lot more bandwidth. But this is quite interesting that we can see 
how traffic is being load balanced effectively. So I'm quickly just going to, I might redo this test again now by just changing the transmit policy to something else. So from the bridge, or not the bridge, from the bonding interfaces, I can go into bonding. And let me change this to something to, like just layer two, which is the default configuration. If I apply this on the switch, and I might have to do the same on the router. So let's see if I can actually get onto the router. I saw it there for a second, there we go. So from the router, I'm also going to just change this transmit hash policy to be just layer two, which is what something you'll see a lot of people do when they show you how to configure LACP. They just make it um, the layer, the default configuration when they do LACP and then they wonder, hey, why doesn't this stuff actually work? <laughs> and it tends to be something as simple as this. So I've set this now to just be layer two. And if I run a ping test again, we can see I do have internet out. And what I'll do is just head back into the interfaces and let's run the same test. Let's do a fast.com test. I'll run the ping or the connection. And there we can definitely see, hey, something isn't adding up here. I'm only doing a gigabit on the one interface instead of traffic being effectively load balanced. So that is why you want to test around and play around with the hashing on your Microtik devices because maybe you just need to use another hashing option and that will work for you. Okay, so I think this actually covers some very great and valid points again. I just wanna run down again through what we are achieving with LACP. The biggest thing that people tend to mention is the additional capacity because, yeah, it's great. We've got more potential speed across the network or more capacity, I should say. But again, we've also built in some redundancy in the form of if a connection goes down, that the link doesn't effectively die. So I'm going to just do a continuous ping to Google and let me plug out one of these interfaces. I'll plug out Ether3 going from the HAP AX3 down to the switch. I think it connects onto Ether23 on the switch. And there we see, I drop maybe a single packet, but things keep working. It, it doesn't effectively just die completely. So we still have that layer of redundancy. And then the third and also quite valid point is that traffic can be load balanced across links, depending on the correct hashing option or algorithm that you're using. Because load balancing is very important because if a single link gets saturated, any traffic that goes over that saturated link we'll still draw packets, so that is worthwhile mentioning. All right, cool. I think this has been a great starting point when it comes to how to configure LACP on a Microtik device or network. And hopefully this has taught you what LACP is, how it works, how you can configure it in your network, and what makes it so awesome. I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. See ya.